ladies and gentlemen. Hello. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure for me to be here today speaking to you. Um, my background is a little bit unique in uh, comparison to a lot of other people who research this subject. And my specialty is the famous 1967 Patterson-Gimlin film. I've given pretty much all of my attention to that. Now, a lot of people think that this film is kind of old news, that it's been studied for 45 years and there's nothing new to find out about it. There's nothing new we're going to see if we keep looking at the pictures over and over again. Um, a lot of very, very fine and talented people have studied this film over 45 years and uh, they still seem to have a little difficulty reaching a conclusion that is so powerful that it um, prevails over any uh, cynicism or skepticism about the film. And myself being sort of the new kid on the block, I've only been doing this now for about five years, uh, a lot of people kind of wonder why I might be in a position to do something with this film that other people haven't done. And the reality is that each of us, when we analyze any data, we bring to that analysis a prior experience. And the simple reality is that I bring a certain level of prior experience to this whole topic that no person before me in the 45 year history of the film had. Oddly enough, that experience is with skin. Uh, I may sound a little silly or a little bit uh, racy, but what I'm actually talking about is the fact that I spent many years professionally as a, pro a makeup artist in Hollywood, and skin is our canvas. We <coughs> paint on human skin to create makeups. Uh, once you get into character makeup, you start changing the way the skin looks. You make it look older, you make it look younger, you make it look fatter, you make it look skinnier, more healthy, less healthy, dead, alive, whatever. Uh, we work with skin itself and we work with altering it. So we study the characteristics of skin, how it moves, what kind of texture it has. We study the soft tissue that is underneath the skin. And then if you go into the more specialized field of creating monsters and creatures, which is something that I did for many years, we try to create artificial bodies out of various rubber compounds that look like real live skin. So we spend a lot of time studying what real live skin actually does. And oddly enough, it is that particular expertise that I have, which no prior researcher in the 45 year history of the patterson Gimlin film had to bring to this topic. It's allowed me to look at the film and see things that other people missed. A lot of what I'm going to be showing you uh, in this program deals with some elements of the body that isn't about bone, it isn't about body proportions, it isn't about musculature and such like that. It's about the skin and the subcutaneous fatty tissue that's underneath it, and some of the aspects of the body that are soft tissue that are responsive to the fluid dynamics of motion when the body is moving. And these are some of the things that I'll be covering in quite a bit of detail. Now, I had, did happen to notice that there are some children here. Um, I'll just tell you right up front, in one aspect of this, we are talking about the breasts on the figure that we commonly call Patty. And the only way that we can truly study that uh, is by studying real physical anatomy of human beings as well as prosthetic devices that are made for costumes. So I will tell you right up front that there are a few brief sequences where we will see some women's breasts. Uh, it's done in a very clinical and scientific way, uh, but just as a PG warning for you, I thought I would bring that up as a courtesy to you all. Um, the first thing that we're going to go with, though, is uh, the head. We're going to basically start with Patty, and we're going to start from the head and work our way down. So, Brian, if you'll cue up that first video. Um, I had to make a head that is a model of Patty, and you can go ahead and start to run it. The first thing, though, is to establish the scale for its size. Now, if Patty were to be a uh, human in costume, as many people claim, uh, the person wearing it would probably be around 6263, and the costume or whatever would have to be scaled accordingly, and the head mask would have to match that. 
So in that first picture, what I was doing was scaling up the picture so that it was something where I could conceivably fit into it. And then the pictures that you saw on the wall there were a back view and a bunch of side views of the head that were scaled exactly to that full-size body. Now what I'm doing is cutting out a pr true profile of the head based upon these various head enlargements that are done to the scale. And this is the back view of the head from later on in the film. Now what I had to do is subtract the thickness of the fur. That was calculated to be about three quarters of an inch. So the actual shape of the head would be minus the fur. And then if we add fur to it, it'll fill it back out. From the head side in the um, back view, I was able to make this uh, three-dimensional representation of the head. And then upon this, I'm now able to sculpt the actual head itself. Uh, the head originally was made out of a white material that's called board styrofoam. Um, it's sold in most hobby stores, and uh, they make Christmas candy canes and wreaths and all kinds of things out of it, Easter eggs and such. Um, it's a craft material that we use for construction of things, and it's a very easy one to shape, so I'm using that in two-inch board thicknesses all around this maca to produce the basic fundamental head shape, and then I would take that tool that you see over there, let's see if I get this working right here, that tool right over here, which is actually a hand rasp, it's an excellent tool for shaping styrofoam, and round out the head until it has basically a head shape. Uh, the next step up was to sort of detail the face, marking out eyes, nose, and mouth, uh, carefully cutting away around them with a, an exacto knife uh, so that I could shape the mouth, the nose, and the eye sockets a little bit more delicately. This was basically the finished base shape of the head, and I'm coating it with plaster now to seal it up so that I can apply some plastilina clay to detail the face a little bit more precisely. The clay wouldn't stick to the styrofoam, but once the plaster surface is on and sanded smooth, uh, then the plastiline clay will attach to it. It allowed me to produce a face that was a little bit more realistic in detail. Uh, I'm coloring it a dark tonality right now because when we texture a sculptured surface, uh, the texture actually changes how much you notice it depending on the coloration. So by spraying this into a kind of a darker brownish tone, uh, it allowed me to see how the textural quality of the sculpture actually appears in that tonality. You have a different sense of it. Uh, this was more or less the finished face uh, that I made up. And from this sculpture, I made some molds and I made both a flexible rubber mask and a rigid mask. And the rigid mask we're going to demonstrate in just a second. But this is the actual head now, full scale, if this were in fact a hoax and a person of about 6'2 or 6'3 were in the costume on the day of filming. Uh, this just shows uh, setting some of the hair which uh, was being patterned and put onto the head as well for the uh, rubber masks that a person wears. And you will see that a little bit later when we're uh, doing some of the experiments with people in costumes. So this is just a little bit to give you an idea of how the head itself was actually made. Um, that should bring this video to a wrap. Why don't you, that's going to shut that down. And Brian, why don't you get the hit? Now, Brian is going to be my demonstration model for this head. This is the rigid head that I made. The reason I made it rigid is because I want to make sure it will not deform when the person puts it on. In other words, this is the finished shape that must be if, in fact, the patterson Giblin is a thing. So this is true full size, too, for how big it is and what shape it is if, in fact, the film's a hoax and that's just a mask and a guy wearing it. So, Brian, if you slip that on first and put it on your head. This is for science. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, tell us what you see. I don't see anything. <laughs> the reason he doesn't see anything is because the eyes are too high. Way too high. His eyes are down about right here. Now I can see out the nostrils. Yeah, I can see you. yeah, you can see out of there just a little bit. Now why don't you tilt it way down forward until your eyes actually are looking out of that? Okay. Now his eyes are looking out of it, but now the mask part right here is shoved right up against his mouth. He can hardly breathe. If he wears this mask for any amount of time, 
and tries to breathe in and out and in and out, all of the expelled oxygen uh, or air that he breathes out of his lungs, heavy in carbon dioxide, is going to stay inside that mask and he's going to keep rebreathing badder and badder and badder air with more and more carbon dioxide. We leave him in there for about a minute or two, and if he breathes enough, he's going to pass out on us. Uh, <laughs> now, while you do that, and you've still got your eyes there, see if you can do a, look at me first and then do a quick turn around in the audience and turn back. And, okay, you're having trouble seeing, it's slipping up, you can hardly even see the ground here. <laughs> So if you're trying to watch the ground that you're walking on, can you see where you're going? No. Okay. <laughs> yeah, definitely will. Uh, now, another interesting thing, um, when we see pictures of, of the Patterson hominid in the film, uh, her head seems to be slumped over, low forward, kind of downward. Well, if you want to slip that back on in a second. Now, right now, his head pretty much straight up and down. If he were to slump his head forward and still be able to see out of the mask, now we got the back of the head going straight out the back, which it does not do in the film. And there's this great big gap here between it and any shoulder costume. The simple reality is, most people don't appreciate this, but that head in the film is absolutely the worst shape or form that we as makeup artists would ever in our life attempt to do if we were trying to make a mask that a person could successfully wear. It's a total disaster. Uh, that's it. Thank you very much, Ryan. Appreciate it. So, starting with the head, right at the top, we have a head which is unusually small for the body. And one of the techniques of um, making costumes and such is the reality that we can only add to a human being's original form. We can't subtract. And a human being has a very high cranial dome right here in the forehead. Patty doesn't. That alone makes that almost impossible for what we see in that film to be a mask. So, um, if we look at it, like I say, starting from the head working on now, just at the head level alone, we've already got reality more likely, mask or costume, fail. So, we've already got one strike against us right now. Why don't we bring up the first picture? Okay. Now, this is one of my test subjects wearing one of the suits that I made and a rubber mask of the same shape and form. And here you will see if I can find a little button here we push. Um, right up around in here and around in there again, you can see the gap between the head and the body um, that will occur because he's just trying to see the ground so he can walk and not fall down. Uh, we do not see that in the Patterson film at all. We see an absolutely smooth, continuous form going from head to neck that never in any way, shape, or form shows us any irregularity or any break between a mask and a body costume. And we see the back far more than we see the front in that particular film. And all throughout it, we never see anything even remotely like this. So we are looking at something which, from the standpoint of the neck itself, uh, once again, the shape we see in the film is a natural neck that flows organically into a torso. It is not a costume with a mask. That's strike two against a costume. Let's go to number three, if we will. Okay, three armpits. Okay, working our way a little bit further down the body, we're gonna look at armpits. Now, there's something very curious going on that most people don't realize. This is the famous 352, the look back picture. And we have the deltoid sitting on top of the shoulder socket and the tricep and the bicep over here. But we have this little bit of fleshy tissue right here that tucks in from the arm going over to into the torso. And this area is pale compared to all of this. It seems like there's far less hair in this area than over on the shoulder. There's also a slight indentation, right, coming down here. Now, going over the same thing, it's marked. The indentation where it sinks in is marked out in green right there, and that little armpit thing is marked right here in magenta. Now, we look at real human bodies. These are some candid photographs. This row right in here. Um, actually, like paparazzi taking pictures of celebrities, I won't tell you who, but anyways. 
uh, we are seeing basically the same thing. We're seeing that indentation. We're seeing the curvature across from the arm going into the torso. Same thing, we're seeing the indentation here and the curvature and the tissue going over into the armpit area. Now this roll on the bottom here, these are some of the research experiments that I did recently uh, where we took five women models and we body painted them gray so they would look sort of like they were wearing, wearing a gray leotard but we were actually able to study their real body. We put a series of black markers on along the collar as a reference. We also put a row of them down the side of the body. You'll see that a little bit later. Uh, but in all of these cases here we see the shoulder mass, the deltoid and everything else. We see this indentation, we see it going over into the armpit area. We see that here, here, the indentation. We see it over and over and over again on real biology. Now let's go to the next picture, if you will, and I'll show you what's different about a costume. Okay, the reality of a costume is that a costume is traditionally tailored exactly like clothing that we wear and particularly the arm is tailored exactly like the sleeve of a shirt. So one of the costumes that I made, this is it finished, but basically the way that we tailor a costume is we make a torso section that's like a vest, and we have a hole, it's basically an opening where we're going to make the arm sleeve, and then the arm is one piece of fur, and it's only seen of the inseam, and cut on an oval, and we attach this oval to that. That's how we make an arm for a costume in just about every case. That is the standard procedure. But it will never produce that fold going into the armpit right there. It has a seam that goes in the opposite direction. So when we look at that particular figure of Patty, uh, the top again, um, that simply is not the way that we build costumes. Now let's go to the next one if we can. Um, interestingly enough, on other great apes, Dr. Mellon was kind enough to provide me with these reference pictures. We see something very similar to this also on the chimpanzees. We see the uh, little bridge of skin that goes over from the arm into the torso. And on this one also, we see a little bit of that indentation under the deltoid and the cap of the shoulder joint. Uh, so we see this also on other great apes as well as human beings. So this curious structure of the armpit, which has not been given a great deal of attention in terms of the PGF film, actually uh, is remarkably biologically real. And you would have to wonder if someone were trying to hoax this, would they really know that much about anatomy, first of all, to even know to try to build that into the suit? because you'd have to go against all standard and common practice for building costumes in order to get that effect. The second thing is you would have to then wonder if you go to all of the effort to build that structure into the armpit, the chest going into the armpit, and then you stage the film where practically the entire time you're photographing it from the back and can't see this amazing thing that you invented and spent so much time doing, except for one second when she looks back at camera and the only way that you can see it is if you enlarge each frame and superimpose one over another to study it and they didn't even have that technology at the time for proper film analysis so when you try to think about this and think about okay this guy's going to fake it he's going to make this suit but he's deliberately going to make the armpit in a way that goes against all practice designing suits and costumes. And then he's going to stage it so that the backs do him all the time and he never sees it, but maybe he'll get one little glimpse of it in that look back. It makes no sense. You know, if you are going to build a costume and if you are going to put a lot of effort into something that's unusual, and you think will help make it more real, you're going to film it in a way so you know you can see it. Roger, when he was filming, if we were to imagine he was filming a hoax, there's no way he could have known he would see that, but there's no way he could have gotten that into a costume unless he spent a great deal of effort planning it, designing it, and fabricating it specifically for that effect because it goes against all common practice for building costumes. It makes no sense whatsoever. So that's three strikes against a costume so far, three strikes for reality. <laughs> what are we moving on to next? We've got a video now. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, right. Uh, this is probably the press. Okay. Now we're in the press, ladies and gentlemen. Um, in studying this, I, this is looped right here. We see the breasts right here. There's a little bit of motion in the way the breasts move when she turns the camera, but these two frames in particular isolate the motion most specifically. When the breasts compress vertically, they widen horizontally, and they separate slightly because what she's doing with this leg is stepping down a little lower than she anticipates. She's looking at the camera, she's not looking at the ground. The ground's a little lower than she thinks and she crashes down and that crash sends a shock wave up the body and that produces that press. Now what I'm doing in research experiments is to see if I can duplicate that. This particular device, what I've made right here, is a simple platform on a parallelogram configuration of metal and what you saw before was two of the models were standing on it testing it. This is how I mounted the costumes that have the prosthetic breasts attached to it. Uh, this is basically with the costume rig set up. When I have the models on, I remove that and just use the platform. Now, basically the way this has been designed on this particular parallelogram structure that you see here, it's been designed in a way that I can control how far this platform falls before it comes to an abrupt stop. Uh, as I lift it up, you'll see these sheets of half-inch plywood beneath it. Depending on how many sheets I put in, I can control it so this will fall one inch, one and a half inch, two inches down. I can test each one of those. I can repeat it time and time and time again, and whoever or whatever is attached to this platform when it hits that stop, it will experience a shock wave, which is repeatable and consistent throughout the experiment. The exact same shock wave will occur for the humans who are standing on the platform, and it will occur to the costume prosthetic figures that are attached. Now, this is just getting the models used to the experience that of testing it. Now, here we go, once again, the both pictures top and bottom are the same, but they fluctuate between one frame and another. And here we can see where there is definitely a fluidity, a shift in the mass of the breast. It changes its form in a fluid dynamic form. Now the question is, does real anatomy do the same thing? Well, here we have two ladies who were kind enough to uh, volunteer as models for this. And when their body drops and hits the platform, you can see it produces a substantial shift in the mass of the breast tissue and it produces a variation very much like what we're seeing over here in the Patterson film. So, what we're seeing here does match something organic or real. Now if we go over to the breast prosthetics, I made these out of the three materials that were available in 1967. Now, you may not realize it, but this one is crashing down two inches and coming to a abrupt stop, and it's not moving. This first one, which is made of slip rubber, I mean, I might as well have made it out of concrete for all the motion that we're seeing there. You can't even tell it's moving except for the way the fur on the side kind of shifts. Okay, so the first material, slip rubber, that's a fail. Let's go to the second material here. This is polyurethane foam. That's our second choice of making prosthetics that are attached to costumes. Once again, you can see the fur shifting here. It's crashing down two inches and coming to an abrupt stop, and it's not rippling a bit. I mean, there's nothing going on there. Absolutely nothing. And this is very soft, pliable, synthetic foam material. Now we finally go to the third one, which is kind of the Rolls-Royce prosthetic <coughs> materials for movie, which is natural foam latex. So I cast another set of breast prosthesis for a third costume out of natural foam latex. Once again, there's a little change in the fur around it, but the breast is doing absolutely nothing in terms of a shock wave, in terms of fluidity, in terms of any replication of natural organic tissue. These are the three materials that would have been available in 1967 to make a breast prosthesis to put on a costume for somebody to dress up like Patty. Every single one of these in terms of fluid motion is a 100% failure. I'm not even talking 99%, I'm talking 100% failure to produce 
what we saw in the Patterson-Gimlin film. The breasts that we are looking at in that brief sequence are real, organic breasts that have a natural weight, a natural fluidity, water within the cell tissue structure of the breast mass, and they have a motion that is perfectly realistic and natural. They do something that no costume does, period. Okay, so that's fail number four. Usually three strikes are out, we're already at four, and we still haven't finished yet. So it's not looking good for the costume. All right, next up. Okay, skin shaking. Now, this is an interesting one that most people don't realize, and because, as I say, I have background working with skin as a makeup artist and studying how it moves, how it looks, and everything else. Um, I've looked at these pictures. This one happens to be a pair, this is going to be a pair of Sebachrome pictures, uh, 350, 352. This is from another copy of the film. It's a little later in the look-back sequence. But what we're looking at right here, these markings across the hip and this marking on the leg, as the leg extends, these marks shift downward. Now here again, we see it a little bit more obviously, the marks here in the leg. As the leg extends, the, the whole skin from right about under the armpit shifts downward. It stretches and compresses, stretching and compresses. But it does so in a perfectly uniform fashion, as if it's all one continuous tissue structure. Okay, that we were able to identify on the Patterson-Gimlin film, this curious shifting of the skin with the fur eyes. Now, these are my test subjects, both real subjects and people in costumes, to see, okay, which one matches better? Does the real biology match or the costumes? Now, this is fluctuating all of them, about two frames apart. Then I'm going to go in closer on the ladies and then closer on the gentlemen. Let's go in first closer on the ladies. What we see right here, from that point right about there, it doesn't move. That's fixed. But across the pelvic area, it stretches, going down. Coming up to this one, it's actually fixed right about there. And again, it shifts downward uh, when it goes through the pelvis, depending on the angle of the leg. Coming to our third model, um, for some reason, her anchor is right on this spot. That spot doesn't move. But if we look at what it moves across the pelvis, the skin is shifting downward as her leg changes its attitude in terms of stretching or straightening out. Now let's look at costumes. Okay, on this costume, we actually cut markers in the fur so that we can see it. And yes, these little markers do shift up and down, but if you look right up here, you're going to see this huge buckling of the costume because the chest is a little more rigid than the fur cloth. When the fur cloth is glued onto the chest piece so they join together, you have the two materials plus glue, that makes that boundary just about rigid, so the cloth buckles in this funny diagonal going right across here. Totally unnatural. Now, we didn't get a chance to go to Joe, but over in Joe, we get this buckling right across here, which even looks sillier, because when it butts up against the chest piece, it makes that crazy shape right there. Now, the reality is, again, when we go back and we compare to the Patterson-Gimlin film, what we were seeing on the real bodies matches the shifting of the skin perfectly. What we were seeing on the costumes, the buckling that would go up on a strong diagonal that way, or the whole thing would buckle around that way, we see absolutely nothing of that. We do not see any apparent change in the density of the tissue from here to here. It's all one continuous type of structure. It's all natural skin. It's not a costume with different parts to it. So once again, our costume is a total fail. Our real biology matches extraordinarily well. Okay. All right, now let's go over to the back. The back's kind of curious because we see the back a lot. Now with our dear lady right here, these are some of the early frames of the film. She has this funny little line on the back, which you see here and here. And on this section, it's the same six pictures where in red I've marked where that line is. It's kind of a very pronounced fold right underneath the arm area. Now on a costume, there's only one way you're going to get that, and that is if you actually structure padding to that exact shape and then tailor a fur cloth to that exact shape. 
Let me show you costumes that were not tailored that way. Um, these are some examples right here, and then the examples are repeated with some red lines to give you some idea. Uh, this first one right here, it's got this huge diagonal line that goes down the back, and that depends on which arm is forward and which arm is back. Uh, completely artificial looking. We have on the second costume right here, we've got this huge L shape going down here, and this crazy diagonal going up this way. That's right there. <laughs> going into the third one, we've got crazy little diagonal going off right there. This is a very heavily padded costume. And here we have absolutely nothing. So looking for a shape like that on a costume, whether it's unpadded, partially padded, or fully padded, we don't find it unless the person making the costume actually specifically designed and tailored that costume to have that contour. And why they would do that, because it isn't musculature, it's flab, with all due respect, you know, being very candid, that's what it is, it's flab. It's excess fatty tissue underneath the skin. And why someone would design a costume of a lady Bigfoot who's flabby, you know, instead of muscular, powerful, and scary, again, it doesn't make a whole lot of a sense. But the only way they could get that into a costume would be if they were to design it very specifically. As far as I know, from every costume that had been done in all of Hollywood up to that point in history, nobody had ever designed something, anything even remotely like that. Go to the next picture, sir. Okay, but now let's look at reality. Okay, here we have Patty up again and the thing's marked. I happened to be on the beach one day and uh, uh, had my camera with me, and I happened to see this gentleman who's standing out on the beach and he was watching his children playing in the surf. And I was looking at it, looking at it, and I was saying, that's familiar. Where have I seen that before? <laughs> God, what are these lines here? Well, that's what What's the line right here, the line right there, all of that. Let's take a look at these. People who are advocates of naturism and like to go to clothing optional facilities. Uh, look at all these folds right here. You would swear if you didn't know for certain that these were all real biological human beings, you would swear that those are all cheap costumes with drapery hanging down the back. But these are all biologically real, every one of them. What uh, most people didn't realize, you know, when they were studying the Patterson-Gimlin film before, they were looking at skeletal structure, they were looking at musculature. And they didn't think to look at flab, for lack of a better term. The reality is Patty's overweight. You know, she may be bulking up for the winter. That's actually reasonable for something that lives outdoors and has to endure a long winter where there's not a lot of food. They bulk up in the autumn. They eat a lot. They build up the body fat reserves. And they carry that fat reserve, so it's going to carry their body through the cold winter times. So it's entirely possible that Patty, in October of 1967, is bulking up her body to get ready for the impending winter. And we are seeing some of these deposits of adipose tissue and fatty tissue that are accumulating in pockets of the body so that she can carry some extra nutrition with her. And with bodies that are not exactly in the most perfect shape and would not qualify to be in a centerfold in Playboy magazine, as none of these certainly would, um, the reality is this is what human bodies do look like. And Patty's body is very humanistic in many respects. So we can make comparisons there. What we're seeing here is examples of pockets of fatty tissue. We see them on Patty, we see them on real people, we do not see them on costumes. If it's an ordinary costume tailored a standard way, you will never see these shapes and forms. Okay, so like once again, costume fail, reality wins. Let me go to the next one. This one is the fun one. This is the one that skeptics for many, many years had so much fun with. It's that line right across there, and people have looked at it and said, oh, that's got to be a suit. I mean, humans don't have lines like that on their body. It doesn't match any musculature. No, 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 it's got to be a suit. There's one makeup artist, and I respect him very highly, a man named Chris Wayless, so I'm not saying this to demean him in any way. 
But in 2004, he was looking at uh, these pictures. He decided to take an interest in it. And he looked at it and he said, aha, this is exactly what we would see if we designed a suit in two pieces. And we had leggings, and then we had a top piece that had a snap crotch. And it had an arch across the hip where the top piece would overlap the bottom piece. And he said, aha, see that line right there? That's evidence of the two-piece suit with a snap crotch. That was his conclusion of it. Now, there's only a few problems with it, and I wish that I would have had a chance to have a dialogue with him, and perhaps uh, um, we might have been able to achieve a consensus with a slightly different opinion. First of all, if you have a one-piece suit, such as these gentlemen you see right here, that curvature will never occur, period. It will not occur in that costume. It's a compound curve. It curves on two-dimensional planes. Fur cloth never does that in any kind of a natural or smooth way. So that's a problem. But let's look at this idea that maybe it is a two-piece suit, and maybe it was designed with the torso section, and then we have the upper section, the snap crotch that closes it up, and we have the line going right across the hip like that. Let's, for imagine, a moment, explore that idea. Okay, you have to find a way to secure the upper piece to the lower piece. That means you not only have fur cloth on top of fur cloth, you also have some type of a closure material such as Velcro or a snap strip or something like that. Something must secure those two pieces together. That's gonna make it rigid, okay? Then we have this curious little notch right here. See it better right there on Patty? There's absolutely no explanation for that in a costume that could not occur in a costume unless the costume designer made a deliberate decision to put it there. And why would he do that? It makes no sense. It doesn't look natural, or at least most people would say it doesn't look natural. It would be perceived as a flaw in the costume. Why would someone deliberately put a flaw in a costume? That makes no sense whatsoever. Okay. So when you think about this as a costume, first of all, that shape, if you made it and you had it as two overlapping pieces, then the closure structure that joins the two together will make that virtually rigid. Now we've already seen on Patty that that area of the hip has a fluidity of stretching, stretching down, coming back up, depending on the posture of the leg. That stretching would not occur across a rigid structure in an otherwise soft costume. Any rigid closure structure locks everything down at that point, and it will buckle right before it, or it will buckle after it, but it won't continuously slip or slide or stretch. Second thing, though, is that that little notch, that little notch right there, um, if that were built into the seam, that would not stretch or deform in any way. What would be underneath that structure would be absolutely rigid. And yet in the previous picture when we were looking at it, when it was stretching, it was actually compressing vertically and it was widening horizontally. Now, skin will do that perfectly. Stretch in one direction, compress in the other. That's perfectly normal behavior for skin. The costume would not do that. So the reality is that this structure, this arching of the leg and this little notch right here, uh, don't make sense on a costume. A costume that was designed the way it was described would not have that structure. One other thing before we leave on this slide, you see this little set of yellow dotted lines? Patty's got this funny little dark line going up and down here on the rear of the buttocks. Um, which is an odd line, it makes no sense whatsoever in any kind of a costume. Uh, but nonetheless, it is on the old girl. And now we're gonna switch over and we're gonna look at people again. We're gonna look at real human anatomy. First of all, we're gonna focus on that hip line right there. Okay, the one that's the red one right there, the one that people say absolutely positively does not occur on human beings. Well, surprise, surprise, surprise. They're not the most beautiful human beings, granted they're a little overweight, uh, picking up a little bit of cellulite, but the reality is that fold is biologically real. 
It's not a costume fold, as many skeptics like to say. That line right across there is absolutely biologically real. You do see it on people. You do see it on people who are a little bit mature, a little bit overweight, maybe not in the greatest shape, or maybe their body is accumulating a little bit of excess fatty tissue, especially cellulite, and we see it in reality. It's real. Now we go to the next one. That little notch that we saw in Patty, this thing right here. Uh, yeah, if we can enlarge just a little bit. This funny little notch right here. Well, surprise, surprise. It occurs on real buttocks. I don't know what it is. I don't know why it sinks in in that spot, but it does. Not on everybody necessarily, but on enough people that I have no trouble finding picture after picture after picture of it. So that's perfectly real. Uh, marked them in green right here on this set right there. But that funny little indentation is biologically real. Yeah. Now, that little diagonal line going up that way. Oddly enough, on the buttocks, we have lines that go up like so. This one's a little bit more subtle. This one's a little bit more lumpy and such like that. But we have, again, in the fatty structure that accumulates in the hip region, we do see some of these odd lines and contours, and it's perfectly biologically real. Makes no sense in a costume whatsoever, but for real biology, if you take the time to look at something that isn't quite center hold quality beauty, uh, and look at the real bodies of real people who are not the most beautiful to look at, perfectly natural bodies, but they obviously are mature, a little overweight, accumulated, a little bit of extra fatty tissue. We see these shapes all the time. They're perfectly normal, they're perfectly natural. And going back to the costume again, the costume, there's nothing like it that matches it in any way unless you meticulously tailored all of those things into it. And then you'd have to ask, why would you do you know, you'd know that somebody who doesn't know anything about costumes would look at it and say, oh, but that's a fake, look at those stupid lines in there. Because they wouldn't take the time to research real biology. It would make you wonder <coughs> if, in fact, this were a fake, and if Roger actually did make a costume for this, did he really research human anatomy this well to know that these things are natural? Would he have even done that? Very, very hard to believe. But the simple fact is, every one of these lines and shapes that skeptics love to say, uh, oh no, that's got to be a costume. There's nothing like that on the human body. There are. They're plentiful. It's very real, very organic. It's the real deal. So once again, we've got costumes fail, real anatomy scores one more point. Now, we go to an interesting little thing. There's a few skeptics who have looked at Patty and they invented this term for her costume, which I, in my 40 years making costumes, had never heard. But they refer to it as subduction. Now, to me, coming from California, where we have earthquakes all the time, subduction is when one earth plate crunches under another one and causes an earthquake. That thus is subduction. But some skeptic coined the term, and what he was referring to was the idea that he said the buttocks of the costume is padded and the leg, when it moves back, is sliding under that costume and tucking under it right there. He says, aha, that's subduction where the thigh is subducting under the buttocks padding. Proof it's a costume. Well, okay, costumes conceivably could do that, I suppose. Okay, I'm not gonna argue they can't, they probably could. Question is, do they occur in reality? Now, oddly enough, um, when I was doing these uh, tests with these ladies that were body painted and such, um, this was not actually one of the tests. This is something which we were just taking random shots of them, um, doing some of the basic physical motions that we were studying. And the people who were operating the cameras would just kind of let the cameras run, and I went through all of the footage and found something which I didn't expect and was kind of like a little delightful bonus. On this particular model right here, uh, as she's walking around and walking around, um, the body paint that had been applied right there between where the thigh and the buttocks joined, uh, the skin had rubbed so much 
that the body paint rubbed off. We see it there, we see it there again. And literally, her thigh tissue is subducting under the soft tissue of the buttocks. And it's doing it so often with every single step that it rubbed off all the body makeup. And that's the pale area on the bottom. I marked it in red right there. But that's basically it. That's exactly what we saw. One area of skin has tucked under and rubbed against the other area of skin so much that it rubbed off all the body makeup. So if indeed you say, oh, I see some subduction of the tissue of the thigh going under the buttocks, group it's a costume. Well, unfortunately, it happens in real life as much as it could happen in any costume. So any argument that that is proof of a costume, that's out the window. Now, in this case, I have to say, in all honesty, it would be a draw. Costume can do it, real biology can do it. So no winner in that particular one, but the fact is, we cannot use that argument to say that is a fake. It doesn't work. Okay, what have we got? Yeah. All right, we got one final thing here, and uh, it's a little curious thing. Uh, Patty's got a line going right across her hip right there. Okay. Uh, a lot of people have been curious about what that line is. And um, of course, if you know anything about the Patterson film, you know a guy named Bob Hieronymus claims, I'm the guy in the suit, I'm Patty. And he describes wearing some rubber hip waders underneath his costume. Now, the skeptics who like to believe that Bob's telling the truth, they say, aha, there's the line right there. That's where the hip waders end. Okay. Conclusive proof, Bob's telling the truth, and he's Patty, and that's the costume. Okay. A lot of people buy into that. Now, what I want you to look at is something very, very subtle, all right? I want you to look at this area underneath the line and watch when the hand swings back and forth. It's light, it's dark. It's light, it's dark. And it changes light to dark as the hand swings forward or backward. Because what is happening is that Patty is actually rubbing her hand right up against her fur. And she's brushing the hair. Now, when you brush fur, depending on whether it's laying in its flattest form, the way it's normally brushed out, it has the most sheen. If you brush it or back brush it away from its lay of the hair, it ruffles up slightly. You see more shadow going down into it, and it appears darker. So with any type of fur, and this goes for real fur and artificial fur alike, if you are rubbing the fur in two different directions, it will change its color, well, not necessarily color, its light dark tonality. And that is what we are seeing, going and going in. that is what we're seeing right here. There it's light, there it's dark. There it's light, there it's dark. And it's coordinated perfectly with the swing of the arm going down across that. Now, one curious little derivative of that, try to imagine now, where is her thumb? Okay? Turns out her thumb is exactly where that line is across the hip. Now, if we know that the palm of her hand is brushing against the hip, her thumb has got to be rubbing against the fur. And it's entirely possible that she's just been walking like that for so long that her thumb has literally kind of worn the fur in that area and produced an irregularity in the way the fur is in density or the way it lays or such like that to produce that line. But that line is exactly where her thumb is and her hand is absolutely brushing right up against the fur of the body. So I can't say conclusively that explains the line, but it is an option that we seriously must consider that would be biologically real, perfectly plausible, definitely validated by the change in the coloration of the fur showing that the hand is brushing up against it. So here again, the claim that that line is conclusive somehow, it's got to be artificial, it couldn't be natural, the claim has no merit. 
So, this is what we're looking at with this old lady, and if we were to add up that score, we'd probably have about eight or nine points that say real, and we'd have basically zero that conclusively says costume. The simple reality is, ugly as she is, and I don't say that in a demeaning way, she's not attractive by our standards, uh, the old girl is real. It's that simple. We don't build costumes like that, especially not in 1967. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.